And thanks to our panel for uh, joining us this evening, as well as all of the uh, surgeons, as well as um, equipment representatives that uh, are joining us tonight. Uh, hopefully we can provide uh, a excellent overview of the Dyna Bunyan system and also answer your questions uh, at the end of our um, uh, discussion tonight. You can go ahead to the next slide, Scott. So each of us will give you know, uh, some different portions of the concept behind the Dyna Bunyan, and then also a couple of case reviews that are unique to our practices. And then at the end, we'll go through um, the panel discussion and discuss um, what is our algorithm for uh, treating bunions, as well as um, looking at uh, the recovery protocols and those type of things. So there'll be some time for you to uh, discuss this further. So um, we'll go ahead and look a little bit into the uh, Dyna Bunyan system. And so uh, in the concept with this was something that everyone's aware of nowadays with uh, trying to uh, correct the multiplanar deformity that is a bunion at this point. And so we look at this in a uh, 3D, 3D correction as far as the transverse plane, the uh, uh, frontal plane, as well as the sagittal plane. And so this is just an animation that you can see there as far as uh, providing that uh, um, pronation, supination correction, as well as uh, the adduction uh, as the first TMT joint is corrected. So, you know, we wanted to make something that was simple and reproducible. Uh, that was the primary goal when uh, we looked at this system, but we also wanted to incorporate uh, many of the tenants of the Crossroads company, which is night melt compression. So, you know, again, we're looking at a system that is going to provide us these corrections. We want the transverse frontal and sagittal plane, but we also want to have something uh, or wanted to have something that would provide us uh, co compression at the same time. And what we came up with, what was termed the 4D rack block, and really what that is, is a compression block that you place uh, after you've uh, gotten your compression, and then you can provide additional long lasting compression with the plate and staple construct. The staple again is a night null staple, which provides continuous compression across your fusion site. So uh, the mnemonics that uh, we've come up for this are going to be the cut, correct, cut, compress, and what that means is that what we look at first is the base of the first metatarsal. We're going to cut that, and then we're going to correct your uh, uh, pronation as well as your, uh, 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 your inner metatarsal angle at the same time. And then you'll pin that and come back and cut your cuneiform. Uh, that allows you then to have had your correction, and then by placing the rack block, which is in that lower right under over the top of compress, you're compressing across your fusion site. At that point, uh, you can place your uh, plate and staple uh, construct. Again, you've already have compression. The staple's then going to provide continued compression and then your uh, uh, anti-drift bolt. So when you look at this, uh, what we're looking at is a dorsal medial incision. And so uh, it's about three and a half, half centimeters. You may want to start longer when you first start. First thing you're going to be doing is loosening up the ligaments around the TMT joint, placing your cut block, and then providing your pins distally. At this point, you'll do a cut. And notice that the blade is perpendicular to your first metatarsal and not perpendicular to the cut guide. You'll get a small piece of bone that is uh, released. You'll then turn the cut guide around 180 degrees, provide your correction as far as uh, pronation, and then also your compression <clears throat> across your intermetatarsal at the same time. So you're going to get your pronation correction and then pin that in place and then compress to get your intermetatarsal angle to where you want it. That is then going to align your proximal cut to where you need it to be. And so you will be compressing by utilizing the plantar fascia as a windless mechanism. 
it compresses that paddle that's in your joint and then you pin and then again when you cut it's going to be perpendicular to your cuneiform uh, in order to avoid any uh, uh, accidental cuts to the second metatarsal. There are revision cut guides that was just shown. We also have a Hinterman type device so that you can get into the joint and get any of those plantar uh, fragments, but also drill your surfaces as needed. The one of the slickest parts of this uh, system is now this rack block, which is made to compress across those K wires. You do want to make sure that the K wires are bicortical, meaning that you get the dorsal as well as the plantar aspect. And I have typically transitioned to keeping the rack block in place while I place either staples or a uh, plate and staple construct. If that is not possible, you can pin the TMT joint, then remove the, uh, the transverse pins and rack block, and then come back and uh, place your staples or plate as needed. You can uh, bend the plate as needed. Uh, most of the time, I do not bend the plate. I'll shave off the medial eminence that becomes prominent as you rotate that first metatarsal. This just shows placement of the staple. And again, this is the insertional uh, guide and uh, in insertional device that allows you to uh, modify how wide the staple legs are. There are two options. You have a 14 millimeter leg as well as an 18 millimeter leg that you can place proximally. Um, I continue to use the 18 millimeter leg. I want to get as much purchase as possible. You also have different fixation options, 3.0 and 3.5, both non-locking and locking. Um, I typically use non-locking on both sides of the plate. So this shows the uh, plate construct filling the plate from uh, as a distal screw and then your proximal screws. You can place these screws off axis and across the cuneiform to the intermediate or even the lateral cuneiform if you so desire. This is the uh, anti-drift bolt. And what we're trying to accomplish with, with this is preventing any drifting between the medial cuneiform and the intermediate cuneiform, as well as the base of the first metatarsal and base of the second metatarsal. You do wanna assure that that uh, Screw is bicortical and typically take an oblique film in order to see that uh, uh, when you're placing that screw. So this is just a case of a, a patient of mine that 75-year-old uh, healthy, worsening hallux valgus. And uh, this is before I was able to use the, um, the new plating system. So I ended up having to use the legacy plating system but I did perform uh, first TMT fusion or lapidus fusions on her bilaterally utilizing the legacy plate. If you can go to the next uh, x-ray. And so you can see that uh, you can get excellent overall correction as well as you, uh, for your rotation, as well as your intermetatarsal angle. And again, this is the older plating system. The newer plate has an easier placement of that anti-drift bolt uh, than uh, you see here. You can go to the next one. So this is a patient with uh, midfoot arthritis as well as uh, significant hallux valgus with instability at the first TMT joint. She had had a prior um, hallux valgus procedure done about 15 years ago on the right. Uh, which has gone on to, uh, to recur. But on the left, what we wanted to do was fix her hallux valgus and her bunion, but also treat the midfoot arthritis. You can go to the next slide. She had had corticosteroid injections into the midfoot without uh, long-term uh, relief. So when we looked at, at, look at this, we did a midfoot fusion along with the bunion correction. I do flat cuts at uh, two and three typically, and Crossroads has a guide that's coming out that allows you to do that very easily. And then we did the uh, Dyna bunion technique 
uh, and then worked from medial to lateral. Uh, when I was using the clamp for the intermetatarsal angle that was on the fourth metatarsal neck, uh, and she's about three months out now at this point with a progressing fusion. Uh, and she plans to have her right foot uh, done in the near future. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the time over to Dr. Butler. Uh, and he's going to uh, talk about some of the trends and what we've done uh, to progress and make the Dynabunion better. All right. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, next, we're going to go over some of the uh, latest trends are going with the uh, options that you have with the Dynabunion to uh, facilitate you during the uh, surgical process. Uh, next slide, please. Or might, do you want me to control? Okay. Okay. What's the latest with Dynabunion 4D? Um, these are the first that we're going to go over. These will actually be um, going into greater detail in later slides, but the first is the fully threaded anti-drift bolt. Previously, it was a partially threaded bolt, um, but um, the newer system has a fully threaded to give you a better, um, <clears throat> better fixation across uh, both of the metatarsals um, besides just uh, threads going into the second metatarsal base. Uh, next is the uh, radiolucent transducer, um, which is allowing you to correct your pronation um, and uh, after you get your correction of your front of your what's already gone over your frontal correction, your transverse correction, and your uh, correcting out of the pronation of the of the uh, first ray, you're able with the radiolution trans uh, reducer, you're able to see that you have these reduced sesamoids. It was a little bit more difficult. Sometimes you had to move the uh, reducer out of the way a little bit to with the X-ray to get a better visualization. But now you can clearly see through the the uh, corrective arm then to your correction very nicely. Next is a uh, improvement on the rack block technique. Um, there's a push for the uh, rack block to be kept in place while you're applying the plate uh, for fixation. Uh, and this will allow you to not have a loss in the compression uh, process of the fixation um, by removing the uh, rack block and just pinning it in place. So there's a, uh, a uh, a little more streamlined rack block that is now available for this to be left in place while you place your uh, plate fixation or whatever fixation you decide to use. Um, and then also on the on the set is the Hinderman retract uh, distractor, which allows you to get down into the joint um, and remove the uh, bony fragments. Also do any fenestrating uh, techniques that you might have, and also allows you to uh, get over to the second metatarsal base if you want to do any spot welding on that side. Uh, some of the uh, clinical pearls that uh, I've come across with the uh, cases that I've come across, it's uh, paramount that you really look down onto that plantar surface in the medial side of, and remove any bony fragments that can really impede you getting a nice compression and uh, reduction of uh, across your arthrodesis site. Uh, sometimes if you have a patient that has very... Um, broad or large uh, prominences at the base of the uh, first metatarsal. Sometimes I will actually stick a little freer elevator uh, just lateral to the metatarsal base, which I think helps me sometimes get a, a little bit better correction. Obviously, you want to take that out of there once you compress across the joint, but it can also kind of facilitate the uh, translation over because sometimes the, uh, the base of the second metatarsal might impinge on the second metatarsal. Um, like I already slightly already mentioned, uh, I tried to spot weld a little bit onto the segment of tarsal base to increase the increase the chance of fusion at that area, which can just make a more solid construct. Um, and then um, you still may need in one of those demonstrations earlier in the animation, they showed the grader where you can kind of grade down the medial eminence at the first metatarsal base, which allows you to more or less have your plate sit down a little bit more flush. And lots of times, uh, at least in my hands, I don't usually have to bend the plate if you kind of grade down that that uh, medial prominence at the, the flare of the metatarsal. All right, my first case, uh, this is a 60 year old female, um, healthy, no, uh, no medical issues, um, had a classic uh, large bunion deformity with hypermobile ray. She did have some, a little bit of hallux rigidus at the uh, first MDP joint, but she really wanted to maintain uh, 
range of motion on our first MTP joint. Next slide, please. And so this is my correction. This, this film's probably about two, uh, two months out or something like that. Um, and I, I do implement uh, use of the um, anti-drift bolt and I, I usually add in a little Aiken correction if needed. And this is a variation, obviously, most of these um, are uh, used for uh, bunions, but uh, occasionally um, you have a patient that comes in and you can sometimes use some of these products for other cases outside of a bunion correction. But he has a divergent list frank injury here. Um, and uh, I wanted to use a really strong construct. It was actually a big guy who fell down an elevator shaft and uh, came in with this injury. And uh, you can go over to the next slide. Uh, he was provincially uh, reduced. Um, this was a closed injury, but I wanted to reduce him, get his swelling down. It's kind of like our, our classic trauma principles. If you take care of uh, these type of injuries or see a lot of trauma patients. And then uh, you can go to the next slide. These are stage procedures. This has gone over several weeks. A lot of swelling go down. And I used a uh, Dynabundian construct to fix the first uh uh, first TMT joint, and then I use the um, bridge plate uh, for the second and third, uh, fixing all of this through a um, two incision technique. The, uh, the lateral uh, fourth and fifth rays were actually uh, provisionally pinned uh, for a period of time, and those pins are pulled out in the clinic. He also had a uh, lateral uh, lateral talus fracture, lateral process of talus fracture, but um, with, also with this injury. But it's just a variation of what you can sometimes use these plates for if needed, if you wanted a stronger construct and get some great compression for a uh, arthrodesis of this uh, list frank injury. He's about two months out or something like that. All right, um, we're gonna go ahead and let Adam uh, uh, present to us. Um, we may have to do a video versus uh, live. He is actually in an airport right now because he had to, um, uh, had to travel emergently. Hi everybody, I wanna start off by thanking Depute and Crossroads for inviting me to participate in this evening's lecture. I'm really sorry that I'm not able to do this live with the rest of the team tonight. And it's certainly an honor to have been invited to join tonight's group of distinguished lapidus surgeons. I've been asked to speak on the key elements of the frontal plane correction portion of the Dynabunion procedure in the transition from compression to fixation using the unique tr translucent rack block. I will also present a couple of my cases towards the end. So I wanna start off by reviewing a few basic principles of bunion reconstruction and the specific advantages of using a lapidus to achieve your correction. It's always been interesting that in the world of deformity correction, we have always focused our attention to the cora or the center of rotational axis. In this case, uh, for bunions, the cora is actually located at the base of the first metatarsal, yet most of us have approached this deformity distally where a rather significant amount of translation is required to achieve the same correction. With the lapidus, by design, this does not require translation because it's actually correcting, correcting the malalignment between the first and second metatarsals at the cora. Also, another advantage of the lapidus is the ability to address the deformity in all three planes where the uh, actual deformity is without deforming or warping the first metatarsal like with some of the metatarsal osteotomies. This is key in the restoration of the sesamoid apparatus, and it's the sesamoids, if they're not reduced properly or restored properly in the frontal plane, the toe will actually not trap properly in the sagittal plane with dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, which does increase the chance of the occurrence over a lifetime. And this is what we found with more of our traditional techniques before we started paying attention to the frontal plane, a high risk of recurrence over a lifetime. Uh, and that's, that's why we believe that the chevron, for example, has up to 55% recurrence rate um, because it's not actually correcting uh, for frontal plane. Um, so, uh, this is a step that most of us have done very poorly in the past, and, and that's uh, very much outlined by literature. And it's certainly not a new principle, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, but when, when I talk to my patients about the importance of frontal plane deformity correction and realignment of the sesamoid apparatus, I actually find myself talking a lot about horseback riding and steering a horse with the rein system. You know, you pull the right rein, 
the horse horse's head goes right and you turn right. If you pull the left lane, the horse's head goes left. If you want to stop, you pull them back uh, evenly. But just think how hard it would be to stop a horse if you place both reins on the same side of the, the head, either left or right, and tried to pull. If you Even if you have even pressure, in this case, the uneven pull of the reins would result into the head going to one side and ultimately you would turn instead of stop. So this is kind of how the first MPJ works, especially if the segments are in proper alignment because they function very much like the reins of a horse. So obviously we also need to restore the first MPJ alignment and the lapidus does allow us in this case to um, do this without really compromising first MPJ mobility. Another important feature is the restoration of the peroneus longus function. And this is underrated because it does help to stabilize the medial column and actually plays a key role in the long-term stability of the first ray when compared to more traditional head or neck procedures. And finally, as a result of all these things, th there's a new re renewed interest in the restoration of the first metatarsal alignment through uh, lapidus with all three planes. And we're actually seeing now meaningful reduction in long-term recurrence as stated by more recent literature on this. So as they say, you should always start with the end in mind, and Paul Lapidus was more like a prophet in this case. So when he was teaching um, this over 100 years ago, or close to 100 years ago, it really wasn't um, all that important until the advent of the instrument Lapidus that we actually started to pay attention to what he was actually saying. And the frontal plane derotation might be a new maneuver that has been emphasized, especially with today's bunion reconstructions in the instrument of Lapidus, including the Dyna Bunyan, but um, this was something that we weren't doing previously. And, and even the new MIS Bunyans, including the Mini Bunyan, um, take this into consideration. But I, I wanna go over this statement that he, he has here. Um, conservatism in individualization is indicated for operative correction of the Bunyan. No operative procedure is satisfactory unless correction of metatarsis primus or varus primus is actually accomplished. And this was right out of his article written in 1934. So in reality, we simply rediscovered how to address a true metatarsis primus varus instead of just focusing on the treatment of hallux valgus. And this, this really makes me think that perhaps we should stop calling it hallux valgus and we should start referring this to uh, older terminology, which was probably more correct. And that's basically the, um, the, the metatarsis primus varus. And that's what we're correcting. So as mentioned with the frontal plane, um, this was pretty much lost on us until more recently. Larry Di Domenico was the first one to start lecturing about this um, back in uh, 2014. And then around 2015, Paul Dayton picked up on it and, and has since produced lots of research demonstrating very clearly why this new spin on Lapidus is so important to take into consideration. And in reality, that they were both actually validating the statement made by Paul Lapidus that I just went over uh, back in 1934. But that, that's the new spin. And in, 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 in what's happened is most of us were failing to see what we were actually looking at with this frontal plane. And here's more evidence that has fortified the importance of frontal plane correction. And as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. On, on the right, you see a maneuver that was originally demonstrated in 2015. Um, I saw it probably 2016. Um, and this is where the frontal plane roll of the metatarsal using a single steerage pin at the base reduces and realigns the metatarsus primus varus in the single rotation. And this was really mind blowing to those of us who've been doing lapidus for years, but we're really missing the key principle of this. And I remember when I saw this video for the first time, I realized that I've been doing this wrong for so many years before. And that's why it is so important as a physician to always push yourself to be open to new ideas and new techniques with your patient's best interest in mind, because ultimately it's about getting the best outcome. So speaking of frontal plane correction, the Dynabunion instrumentation has been optimally designed to assist you in achieving the perfect position of your deformity in all three planes, and most importantly, give you the clear visualization to do it. And, and that's this new uh, radiolucent reducer. So they, they definitely um, have paid attention to this. So this was the first uh, IM reducer, which really worked great actually. And as you can see, uh, it did block some clear visualization of the sesamoid, which wasn't ideal. So uh, kudos to Crossroads for listening to surgeon feedback. And they came out with this new translucent version of the IM reducer, which really has made this portion of the technique a lot easier rated graphically. So you can see exactly where your sesamoids, sesamoids are aligning. 
So uh, where, what is this 4D? I, I remember when Crossroads launched the Dynabunny and they referred to it as a 4D correction. Like most of you, I wasn't exactly sure what the fourth dimension was. I, I, I thought I almost had to go back to school and relearn that. And of course I knew what 3D was, but 4D was something new. So once I learned the Dynabunny technique, uh, I can say I know exactly what the fourth dimension is, and that is compression. Um, it's one thing to achieve proper correction on all three planes, but without compression and stable fixation, you might not be able to achieve the desired outcome. So Crossroads has addressed this with the advent of their translucent rack block, which I'm going to go over here in a second. And this allows you to get compression once your alignment has been achieved. And you can either do this by keeping this in place when you go to fixation, or you can use it to achieve compression then using cross joint pin guides, temporarily fixate, and then remove the block and go to your final fixation while maintaining your compression. And this is always the step where my former fellow would always jokingly say, where did the joint go? And uh, I, I think you'll find that when you do this and you get to this portion of the procedure, you'll probably be uh, saying the same thing to yourself. So it's really effective. And this is a, a schematic that goes over that. So on the left, it's leaving the rack block in place while you go to your fixation. On the right, you're using cross joint pins, one through the rack block before you remove it, and then one plantar medially across the intermediate cuneiform. And that's that's the uh, way that I do it. But if I can, I typically will try to leave that rack block in place and fixate from there. Uh, sometimes just to get the, the distal portion of that plate right, you have to end up removing the rack block. But uh, it, it really just depends on the size of the patient and the orientation of the plate in the original rack block. So there, there are little ways that you can try to bias those pins a little bit more dorsal so you end up uh, with the rack block sitting uh, more dorsally and, and with more room for fixation. So uh, I'm going to move on to case reviews. This is a 43-year-old female came in with a pretty significant bunion deformity. And if you notice the relative position of the first and second metatarsal heads, um, there was definitely an abnormal metatarsal problem. And I was a little bit concerned about the length of the second metatarsal. So if the patient's symptomatic in a case like this, underneath the second MPJ, I will go ahead and consent for a shortening osteotomy in the second metatarsal. Um, if they are not having pain there, then I typically will try to shy away from touching the second metatarsal because I don't want to create a second surgical site. And instead, I'll favor putting maybe a distraction graft at the first TMT once I've gained correction. But in this case, um, I, I ended up doing a shortening second metatarsal osteotomy because the patient was having some second MPJ pain. Um, and really kind of, you know, they always say hindsight's 2020. Um, looking at my, my cases as I prepare these, I, I look and see that my um, anti-drift bolt was a little short on that second metatarsal. So I, I would definitely kind of look at this case differently now and say that I should have gotten that across to that far cortex on the second metatarsal base. So here's my second case. It's a 55-year-old female who presented complaining of both feet that were bothering her uh, was worse on the right side. So we corrected the right side first. And again, uh, maybe a little long in the second met uh, relative to the first, but with that being said, um, there was no pain there. So I did not do a shortening osteotomy in the second met, but one thing I wanted to specifically call your attention to is the different screw that we have for the anti-drift bolt. Uh, this one's a fully threaded screw and, and actually this was I think due to surgeon feedback uh, asking for this so that there wouldn't be any slippage. Uh, and the other thing I can give my pat on uh, myself a pat on the back for is I, I did get to that second cortex on the second metatarsal. So this is definitely a, a more desirable um, position for that screw. So that uh, wraps up my portion of tonight's lecture. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. And I should be available um, for the question and answer session towards the end. Well, good evening, all. I'm John Early. I finally made it, though I'm without camera I'm on my backup computer these days. It's amazing what falls apart. Um, when you're trying to do things. Uh, I'm here to sort of wrap it up and talk a little bit about uh, some of the other issues. Uh, Scott, you've got the, yeah. Okay, the fully threaded anti-drift bolt, just uh, another thing, I mean, when it was shorter, that was actually an area that had good, good potential breakage because of the change in the diameter can do this. So giving it fully threaded, besides helping keep the first and second from separating, sort of distributes out the, the bending load, less likely to get uh, one to break 
from that standpoint. So that, that was a, a nice plus to do that there. One of the key things is, is to be careful of is anytime you're doing something where you've got one, one cortex threaded and you're going into the adjacent area is to go ahead and pre-tap it a couple of times, turn it back and then put it back in. Because no matter how hard you try, you tend to get a millimeter or two separation. And I think it's important to really stabilize that joint. You'll see in some of my cases, I find that the inner cuneiform or the cuneiform second metatarsal area still creates a lot of trouble uh, for the for the lapidus, if you're doing specifically just the first TMT joint, um, one way to sort of test that is when you've got the rack block on after you've made your cuts and you think you've got what you want. Release the, if you've used the distal alignment guide, release that or loosen that a little bit, and then put your fingers between the first and second metatarsal. If it is just the TMT joint, it shouldn't open back up. You should not get that reemergence of the uh, intermetatarsal angle. If you get that reemergent, you do have instability at the intercuneiform or the second uh, metatarsal intercuneiform. Watch it on the on the C arm. You'll see it there, and then that's that should tell you that you've got to do something about stabilizing that area, even if it's from the standpoint I've taken off the rack block and then gone back in and reached around with a curved curette to make that area mad so that I get some, some stability in that in the long term. You really want to stiffen that joint up if the tendency is for it to loosen. Now, when your other thing, when you're talking about the, the TMT joint, you're stiffening the medial column. And the one thing that you know, it sort of everybody looks at, but we don't talk about, is you have to make sure that first metatarsal head is in line with the plantar grade alignment of the lesser metatarsals. When you're doing this operation, you can leave it too plantar flexed or too dorsiflexed, which significantly will change your result. You may have a good looking pallix valgus or bunion correction, but you're gonna make either the first metatarsal or the second metatarsal miserable if you're not really careful about making sure the translation is where you want it when you have that rack block. It will translate if you're pushing that rack block down if you're not careful. So make sure you have it where you want it before you start adding fixation, because once you do that, you've, you've bought that position and you'll find out three months later, four months later, whether you've created a problem. So looking at the arthrodesis, I think it's important with the rack block, check your inner cuneiform stability, and then plan your screws to take care of it. That's the nice thing about uh, about the, uh, the, the block screw, as well as being able to take the proximal screws across into the cuneiform to stabilize that joint. And I find myself doing that in a lot of my cases. We'll go to the next slide. Look at some of my, uh, so yeah. So here's a, a female with increased deformity. Now I do something that a lot of other people uh, don't do really often. I get a sesamoid U. The reason being is I've been amazed that no matter what it looks like on the AP view, sometimes the sesamoids are reduced, sometimes the head is rotated uh, and not. So I like to look at that because I don't think every metatarsal needs to be rotated. There, are, there are, it's not just putting the sesamoids where it is, but also making sure that they're reduced on the cristae. And, and in this particular case, looking at it, the cristae is not too bad, the sesamoids are slid over. So for me, that's more about making sure I've, in my hand, re releasing it laterally, getting the joint back where it is to do that. So this is not as much of a rotation as you see sometimes, more about translation and bringing it back around and then getting it into the right level to do that. I think many times I've, I've moved away personally from a, a while or a second metatarsal shortening, even if it's longer, because I found if I get the first metatarsal head in the right position, my second metatarsal algae goes away. So this is a post-op looking at it uh, six weeks. And at that point, uh, these patients are usually full weight bearing uh, with the inner cuneiform uh, component also built through. I use the proximal screw to come across as well as the, the bolt in the end to do that. And bringing it back around, relief, bringing the sesamoids around tend to bring my reduction where I need it to be. Next slide. And that's that one year follow up uh, showing that I really I, you don't lose your uh, situation over time. 
you can see in that er earlier bolt, I was in the habit of making sure that I did not go to the second cortex because I wanted threads both on the first and second metatarsal again to sort of keep that from moving. <clears throat> Next. So here's, a, here's a, a, another case where in this position, it, it's sometimes hard to tell, but for me that Christe is rotated. So the, the whole metatarsal head is rotated. This is more of bringing the head metatarsal back down rather than worrying about the sesamoids. And so I was much more attentive about doing the rotation of this particular first metatarsal as opposed to the one before. So for me, it's important to look at it because not everyone needs every component that this system offers, though it offers every component you need. Next slide. Again, doing it the same way, six weeks, I let them full weight bear after approximately two to four weeks. I let them, I judge by the uh, swelling that the patient has afterwards. If it's really pretty calm, that, that settled down quite a bit to do that. But I've been impressed about how, how fast the swelling does settle down for these particular ones. And like I said before, I'm really uh, quick about putting across the inner cuneiform. I think that's where in a lapidus, when it fails, it's because it fails through there. But this was one where we rotated it back around to get the sesamoids where they belong, as opposed to moving this plantar plate. And again, six months, looking at it from that standpoint. So I guess at this point, we open it up to questions from the, from the audience. Well, we do have a, a few things that we can go through and maybe it'll um, generate some questions. I think that uh, everyone may want to know, you know, kind of what our thoughts are on um, you know, post-operative protocols, uh, as well as what are our algorithms for how we treat uh, the bunions. Do we always do a lateral release? Do we always do an Aiken? Uh, what, what helps our decisions, those type of things? Scott, do you have that next slide or do we have questions that need to be answered? Yeah, can you see, can you see this? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I, I guess as panelists, we can sort of look at it. So, you know, my, my general algorithm is, is to evaluate the stability of the, uh, of the joints. I'm uh, looking at that in, in, in uh, bunions from that standpoint, if I've got a lot of tarsal metatarsal motion or if it's if I can reduce it manually, in other words, if I can bring the first metatarsal to the second, that tells me that there's some inner metatarsal uh, and cuneiform instability uh, to do that. So I'm more likely to do a proximal aspect. In those cases where I can't reduce the metatarsal issues, um, then I can I feel more comfortable looking at something a little more distal if I have to. Um, because that tends to uh, correct it without doing significant proximal issues. MIS, I don't really see many simple bunions, so I don't, I don't really have experience with it. I've been so happy with the, the lapidus doing most of my procedures that I haven't uh, reverted to the small minimal incisions. So we do have a couple of questions um, and I'll open it up to the panel. The um, uh, question is when pushing down the rack block, have any of you needed to go back and make an additional cut to correct alignment, possibly a plantar or dorsal uh, dorsiflexion uh, deformity still being present? Uh, Dr. Early, do you wanna address that one? Um, you know, that that's part of uh, in the, in the technique where you talk about sometimes the, the dorsiflexion issues occur when you don't dorsiflex the great toe to make sure that it's down uh, when you're doing the, the cut guides uh, from that standpoint, if you get a true flexion change. A lot of times it's translation um, to get that. You're really not worried about what the TMT joint looks like as much as are the metatarsal heads aligned uh, when you get that down there. But um, once in a while, I've had tough bone where I've, it's, 
even with the guide plannerly, it's it's sort of skived off. And and I'll do that. I'll feather it freehand from that standpoint. But it's I've had so few problems when I really pay attention to making sure my guide is in the appropriate place. That, that's what I've been real pleased about uh, with this system. Yeah, and I think one of the things like you'd mentioned um, was that, you know, it's a flat cut. So if you need to uh, platually translate, because I think the majority of the time you need to get more stability in, with plantar uh, uh, to, to deform it or to adjust it platually, you can slide it platally um, on that cut and then put your fixation. The, the final key is, again, like what we talked about earlier, testing. Sometimes that dorsiflexion component or plantar flexion component is because the inner cuneiform joint is unstable. And yeah. so if you've locked it there in place and looked at it, and it's still, you can, you can translate it once the rack block is on, get dorsiflexed or plantar flexed. We haven't, you haven't addressed all the joint issues yet. So look at yeah, that. So that goes into the next question. And, uh, and I'll, I'll pose this question and then put it up to the panel. It says, do you always put a screw across the inner cuneiform joint? Do you fuse it if, uh, if also unstable? Um, I have a very low, uh, uh, you know, I'll put an inner cuneiform screw almost every single time. I'm, I'm, I regret not putting inner cuneiform screws more than I regret putting them in. And I've only had to take one out uh, over the last couple of years. I think Again, Dr. Early probably has some opinions on this aspect as far as the intercaniform joint. Boy, you make me sound so opinionated. <laughs> no, I mean, you're just a strong man. But, um, you know, I, there have been occasions where, you know, you test it. I, I always like to have a reason for doing something. So I'll always do that intermetatarsal test before I start throwing screws across to do that. Rarely do I find it stable, but when I do, uh, yeah, I haven't gone across it uh, to to put that in. Um, but you know, like uh, Scott said, have I regretted it? Once in a while, I've been wrong. So it very rarely, it's just easy to put it across. Now I'll do, I'll reach in through the osteotomy site and rough it up. I do want some spot welding. Do I formally take it all down to fuse it? No, I, but I do want some spot welding there and I'll throw some of the morselized graft uh, back there to sort of get it stiff. Yeah, I was gonna chime in. Um, uh, the question before was the plantar flexion uh, when the, with the rack block. And one of the things I had early on when I first started getting used to it was I wasn't bracing underneath the first net uniform. So if you tuck your hand under there and kind of push up on the metatarsal base from underneath as you're pulling the rack block down, that usually gives you good equal compression. So I, I, I learned that the hard way um, very early on because I ended up plantar flexing somebody a little bit too much. Um, and then as far as the inner form screw, I, I almost always do it. And I usually uh, do it with the most uh, proximal screw. And I, I because I'm not using a, um, a locking screw for that, I, I can kind of angle it and get it across the inner form. And I, I don't also take it down. I just kind of spot weld and I, I typically work with a little bit of graft, so I'll try to push some graft over over the edge of that to get it down in there. So the next question um, I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Butler talk about and then anyone else can chime in. Uh, what percentage of Dynabunion procedures are accompanied by an Aiken? And what considerations go into this decision process? Uh, percentage? Uh, in my hands, probably about 50%, um, but it's really just uh, after I've done my correction with the Dynabunion system and I feel as though I want to get a little bit more, uh, a little bit better uh, cosmetic uh, look to the toe or if they have some curvature to their proximal phalanx and it's uh, <clears throat> still causing some deformity, um, then I will still do an Aiken, but I, I, I would say maybe 50%. And I, I tend to do an MIS Aiken, so it's actually really quick. So it doesn't really add a lot of time uh, to the case. And then uh, in the case I showed you, you see, I just put a, a little percutaneous screw across it um, just to hold it and it's, it's pretty quick. Um, I did want to introduce one other thing to the panel and that was lateral release. How many uh, panelists are routinely doing 
a modified McBride or some sort of lateral release with their lapidus procedures? Hardly ever. Well, for me, it goes back to where I see the sesamoids in relationship to the Christe. If the if the sesamoids are are lateral to the to the Christe, um, I I will do uh, a release. Uh, I can get basically of the whole capsule through the I'll, through the medial side. I can get through the to the lateral collateral area and release that. If they're reduced and it's rotated, then I don't worry about it. I was going to say that um, before I used this system, I was using another instrument, Lapidus system, and you almost always had to do a lateral release because you were doing correction before you did the cut. But since I've switched to the Dynabunion system or my use of the Dynabunion system, when you take that first cut off the base of the first metatarsal, you're essentially decompressing that whole metatarsal bone, which makes it a lot easier to swivel it into a corrected position. So what I find myself doing is going through that process first. And if, if I feel like uh, soft tissue is fighting me, then I'll do a lateral release, but I actually do it from medial. I, I make a small incision medially. I make a, I, I use my McLamry elevator across the metatarsal head uh, very carefully, obviously. And I just use the McLamry to uh, tease away the fibers off the uh, lateral capsule. Um, and you know, the, the, the uh, tibial, or sorry, tibular sesamoidal ligament. Um, and that, that usually does the trick. Um, and then going back to Aiken, I, I also find myself, it's about, I, I'm about 50% of the time. I think before I was really adverse to doing Aikens because um, I, I just kind of tried to be uh, as natural as I could. And, and, but I have seen cases where I really can't complain about the position of the first metatarsal and sesamoids, yet you still see a little bit of leaning that toe towards the second toe, thinking that I could have done that better for my patient. So, at this point, I'm, I'm probably looking at that last, but if I feel like the, the toe needs a little bit more uh, cosmetic appearance for the patient's benefit, I'll add that in and it's about 50% of the time at this point. Yeah, for me, I do probably about 50% Aikens. Um, you know, the, the main thing about bunions that I've found, you know, as I've continued to progress in, in my practice is that you can never, you know, where the toe sits, is where it's going to be. So you have to do whatever it takes to get it straight before you put the dressing on. The dressing's not going to provide you any correction. So if you have to do a lateral release, you have to. If you have to do an Aiken to get you know a little bit more correction or correct the hallux valgus interphalangeus, then you know you got to do it. So I, I think you have to uh, going back to um, Adam's talking about uh, lapidus. You have to look at each patient individually and be prepared for each patient individually. Um, yeah, I was just gonna, just to follow up on that. I, I, I really like what you said there. Cause I, I think, you know, it's sometimes you just get into this machine of, you know, wanting to do the same thing every time. And I really think that uh, with the system, you can kind of component things out and do what it takes to get the right correction. And I 100% agree with you. There's been so many times where I'm like, oh, you know, toes leaning a little bit, so I'm just going to splint it over with the dressing. And, and I usually end up more disappointed than not uh, when I've done it that way. So I think you got to get the toes sitting right. The other thing is once you get your fixation in place, sometimes you can be tricked. It, it looks very straight. But then when you go to uh, plan or, uh, you know, push up underneath the first mat and load that first tray, that toe can change position a little bit. So that's another thing I typically will do is at the end, I'll load the foot and just make sure the toe is right where I want it to be. Scott, do you have any other uh, questions or any additional um, topics that you need us to address? Yeah, and Sean, if you all want to walk through your post-op protocols for Lapidus. Okay. Um, so I've progressed, but I haven't progressed as far as others. I'm, I'm getting old. And so we used I used to keep a Lapidus non weight bearing for six weeks. Now I put them in a boot, let them weight bear on their heel immediately, and then progress to full weight bearing uh, at around six weeks. And then depending on swelling as well as um, how much pain they're having, I may progress them to a uh, post-op shoe or a shoe with a carbon fiber insert between six and eight weeks. I, um, I do uh, non-weight bearing for about a week and then I let them do some partial heel weight bearing 
in a in a boot or a post op shoe um, after that, assuming that their swelling is somewhat under control and they don't have any uh, wounds that I'm worried about, I let them full weight bear in a boot or a post op shoe at three weeks, and then they're going into a um, if I'm if it's looking as if it's getting a nice fusion. Somewhere between six to eight weeks, are going into a carbon plate um, if there's if their swelling allows for for it to get into a regular shoe. I was gonna say um, I, I I'm kind of still a little bit of uh, conservative in this. Um, I, I do the non weight bearing for a week, and then I start to weight bear uh, in the boot, just like everybody else is saying, and then I transition around at six to eight weeks somewhere in there into a regular shoe. Um, and I, I was just curious, going back to that last slide, um, somebody had posted, or I guess the question was on the gas shock recession. Um, maybe when we're done with this, I wanted to see what the other panelists were doing in terms of gas shock recession. I, I look at it, I, I can't say that it would seem to do it, but I, I'd be curious to hear what other people think. Geez, you guys make me sound really conservative, um, <laughs> post up protocol. I'm usually not letting them uh, wait bear for at least two weeks, wait till I get my stitches out and get it settled down. I've, I've had bad luck with heel only weight bearing, basically because if they're trying to keep their toes off the ground, they wind up doing all kinds of strange things with the toes, especially if you've done some surgery on them and then it's really hard to get them to come back down. So I wait at least two to two weeks and then based on the swelling, when I let them weight bear, I want them flat footed weight bearing so that, so that they get in that habit of bringing all the toes down to the ground rather than holding them up because sometimes that just sort of is a hard habit for them to break afterwards. And basically, you know, these days since the opioid crisis, you can't give them any pain medicine. That tends to slow them down quite a bit there as, as comfort allows. And women don't like it when it swells. And so that's, that's, a, I use them to use them as the gauge and they're teaching me that they're getting away with it. So um, the, the construct is really stable. We did have a question just come in um, and I'll open up to all of the panelists. Uh, do you find patients feel their foot is stiff from the bolt screw and then any concerns with fracturing of the second metatarsal base? Um, I'll, I'll start with that one. That's one of the things you have to counsel patients on. And that's one of the things that some people don't like the lapidus for. You are stiffening the midfoot, absolutely. If they're used to most of their lives of having this real loose, uh, unstable midfoot, you're going to stiffen it, whether or not it's the second bolt that does it. You need to remind them, this is going to take them six months or so to get used to. The arch is different. It doesn't give way anymore like it did. From the fracturing of the second met base, I really haven't seen that. Um, and I think part of that is making sure that the first and second metatarsal heads are in the right frontal plane alignment. Uh, I'll chime in um, on that second metatarsal base. I will tell you that with some other lapidus systems where you're really, really calpering against that second metatarsal base to get your correction. Um, I've had three or four athletes about six to eight weeks later develop uh, stress fractures there. Actually not, sorry, closer to like three months afterwards. And that's not something I've experienced with this particular system. Um, part of it is I think that the reducer is put a lot more distally, so you're not putting as much stress on it. You're also not putting a wire all the way across the second. I think that's really key, so you're not weakening that second. And um, I haven't had any experience. Uh, my, my, the problem I had early on was I didn't get to that fourth cortex, so my screw just backed out and I got a little bit of a splaying of the first and second metatarsals, but I haven't had any second metatarsal stress fractures. You know, I think this really, you know, if you look at the Grand Rapids experience, they've done hundreds of Lapidus fusions utilizing a four screw technique. And they've been utilizing this first, second intermetatarsal screw for many, many years and not had that uh, any problems. And actually their screws go more transverse to more cortical bone in the second metatarsal and they haven't seen that. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen any screw breakage um, the good thing about this system, it takes minimal bone. So I don't think you are shortening the first ray as much as other systems. So I think that will aid in not getting a stress fracture at your, uh, second, uh, metatarsal base, um, just due to overloading the second metatarsal head. Um, so I, I haven't really, um, seen a sec, uh, a second break due to that, the actual lag screw though. 
And I wanted to follow up actually it's something Dr. Dr. Early said was really, really important. Um, he was talking about the opioid pandemic. And um, I've, I've been doing my best to really, really go away from narcotics in my practice. And so that's kind of along the line of the multiple model um, anesthesia approach. But I will typically have patients take 600 milligrams of um, Neurontin about five hours before surgery with a sip of water. When I do my blocks, I always mix my blocks. So if I do 10 cc's of Marcane, I'll mix one cc of Decadron into the block. And I'll do that up to 30 cc's of Marcane and three cc's of Dex. Um, and, and with that, there a lot of patients are pretty numb um, all the way until uh, 48 hours. Um, and then the other thing I do is I start them on a regimen where they start with two Tylenol and two ibuprofen. They do that right when they get home and they repeat that every six hours until I see them back a week later. And I tell them, do not take your narcotic until you have pain above and beyond with the ice. Or, and I, I work with cryocompression as well. But what, what the ice unit and the Tylenol and Advil combination is doing. And what I find is a lot of patients, if they don't start on the narcotic, they just challenge themselves to stay off of it. And it's, a, it's amazing. I, I'd say 50% of the time at this point in my career, people come back and say that they never touched a narcotic after surgery. And that includes my total ankle replacements. I would say about, about an 80% on those in terms of patients staying off narcotics. But I think that's all of, that's something that we all need to do a better job of for our patients is really trying to steer them away from narcotics. 